a Marxist analysis of the psychology of addiction. The use of substances and attempts at prohibition or other forms of forced abstinence can be dated back thousands of years, but the current growing crisis of addiction is unprecedented in recorded history. While the term crisis is very much overused in the media to create and foster hysteria, it is hard to pinpoint a more appropriate word for the increasing global death toll caused by substance use. There are three primary types of substances that people find themselves addicted to and that put these people in life-threatening and deadly situations. Alcohol, tobacco, and illicit or prescription drugs. While it is estimated that less than half of the global population consumes alcohol, it accounted for over 3.3 million deaths last year. Tobacco was the cause of almost twice that many deaths in 2017, over 6 million people having died in relation to direct tobacco use. The number of deaths related to the consumption of drugs is hard to determine. Even countries such as Canada that have a reputation for more adequate health care have insufficient methods for the collection of data in regards to drug overdose and drug-related complications that lead to death. This is no doubt, a, no doubt a global problem where drug use is not properly researched. However, the UN released a very conservative estimate of almost 200,000 deaths that could be definitively attributed to drug use in 2015, a dramatic increase from years prior that is likely to continue in this pattern. The same report found that 29.5 million people around the world had what qualified as a drug use disorder in 2015. The lives lost due to addiction and misuse of substances is no doubt just one aspect of a larger global mental health crisis. That is not to say that addiction is a mental illness in and of itself. While the DSM-5, Diagnostics and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, the fifth volume, does constitute it as such, labeling it as substance use disorder, as Ian Ferguson notes in his book Politics of the Mind, Marxism and Mental Distress, it is important to recognize that the DSM has contributed to the medicalization of human nature and the medicalization of human nature in everyday life. The DSM is part of a push to depoliticize mental health, treating mental illness and distress as an individuated occurrence. The history of psychiatry has focused on genetics as the primary causation of mental illness and poor mental health, which includes the classification of addiction as a disease of the mind. In the last couple of decades, we have seen a broadening of the approach to mental health, especially in the nonprofit servicing area, to account for social factors in the manifestation of mental illness and the barriers to ideal mental health. This typically looks at individual traumatic events, the role of, of adversity and childhood development up to the age of around three years old. This is certainly a move in a more productive direction as there is little reliable evidence to support the notion of genetic factors being primarily to blame for the state of mental health and addiction in particular. There is no possibility of there even being a gene responsible for addiction, for example, and there is overwhelming evidence to show the social as being the main factor in determining mental health outcomes. However, these popular new approaches remain insufficient in preventing the onset of mental health complications, addiction being one of the most deadly consequences of said complications. From a Marxist perspective, there are a number of contributing factors to the problem of addiction, which include the profit motive for the manufacture and exchange of deadly substances, the purposeful flooding of communities with illicit drugs, and the increase of the distribution of heroin in conjunction with imperialist wars in areas of the world rich in poppies. While these are certainly important aspects of the fatal addiction problem that merit exploration, the actual presence of drugs is not the root of the problem. As trauma and addiction expert Dr. Gabor Matei has clarified, all of the substances that are the main drugs of abuse today originate in natural plant products and have been known to human beings for thousands of years. Not every person who has a beer or uses drugs is addicted. There are a number of substances that have been used historically and even today for therapeutic purposes with great success that are also used to the detriment of the user and other circumstances. There are certainly instances of addiction before capitalism, but as a widespread social problem, it is unique to this particular mode of production. Addiction goes beyond the substances themselves, and the purpose of this essay is to explore the root social causations of addiction as it manifests in the human mind and experience. 
After all, as Karl Marx states in his Economic and Philosophic Man Manuscripts of 1844, activity and mind are social in their content as well as in their origin. They are social activity and social mind. So how do we conceptualize mental health and addiction if not as a manifestation of genetic and biological factors or as individuated traumas and complications in the so-called formative years of our early lives? And how are they related? Our, our intent is not to ignore or downplay a genetic or biological component to mental illness, as most certainly it does play a role. But if we are to understand human beings as primarily social, it is imperative to recognize that man's potentialities are manifested and realized through the social experience, and not just in the first three years of life, but throughout life. Psychoanalyst and Marxist humanist Eric Fromm's understanding of mental health as presented in his book, The Sane Society, is pertinent to our Marxist approach to an understanding of mental health as it applies to addiction. Summing up, it can be said that the concept of mental health follows from the very conditions of human existence, and it is the same for man in all ages and all cultures. Mental health is characterized by the ability to love and to create, by the emergence from incestuous ties to clan and soil, by a sense of identity based on one's experience of self as the subject and agent of one's powers, by the grasp of reality inside and outside of ourselves, that is, by the development of objectivity and reason. In true psychoanalytic form, Fromm takes the approach to mental health derived from Freud's theories of repression. When we live in such a way that the psychological drives that are part of the universal human nature are repressed and our physiological and emotional needs are not met, our mental health suffers. Addiction is a consequence of this suffering. The concept of human nature as put forward by Marxists like Eric Fromm and Ian Ferguson must be differentiated from bourgeois notions of human nature. Marx rightfully rejected notions of human nature that posited that human beings had a common character and that particular attributes such as greed and envy were inherent and not socially produced. Ferguson states, Marx rejected popular notions of human nature which saw it as fixed, static, and unchanging and which often simply reflected the dominant values of the society of the day, such as egoism, greed, or aggression. Rather, a historical materialist approach to an understanding of human nature focuses on the needs of men, but these two are socially determined in their expression. Ferguson also states, a materialist approach starts from the recognition that human beings are biological animals with a range of needs which, if not met, will at best harm or stunt their development and at worst result in death. Thus, good health, both physical and mental, depends on the availability of such basic material preconditions as food, water, light, and so on. Where these conditions do not exist, health suffers. It seems undeniable that human beings have physiological needs that encompass the bare minimum of what is required to survive and thrive. Food, water, light, as noted by Ferguson, protection from the elements in the way of shelter and clothing, and of course, oxygen. For many, this also includes medical expertise to treat health conditions. If, the, if these needs are not met, adverse health conditions can develop, existing conditions can worsen, and death can occur. When these needs are difficult to meet, it causes stress that often has a considerable impact on mental and physical health as well. Furthermore, human beings are differentiated from animals and thus we have psychological needs that animals do not. Men themselves begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual means of life. The conscious ability to produce our own subsistence means that humans have evolved on a social level specific to our species. That is not to say that other species do not have any level of social being. As a consequence, our brains have evolved over millennia to have particular drives that require fulfillment. In fact, the social brain hypothesis posits that primates have such an unusually large brain to body size ratio, specifically due to the complexity of our social systems as we evolved. Neuroimaging studies support this hypothesis, 
as a definite correlation has been found between social group size and particular complex regions of the brain. Human beings evolved for tens of thousands of years in large groups because this was ideal for survival, and our brains evolved accordingly. The few millennia in which private property has mediated the way humans live are but a tiny blip within the existence and development of our species. Our needs, therefore, are social and complex. It is certainly difficult to distinguish what constitutes a true need and a false need, as James O'Connor states in his article, Production and Unproduct Productive and Unproductive Labor, since needs in commodity society are not decided upon prior to the production of commodities, the idea that a product is needed must be conveyed and accepted before that product can become a commodity. Bourgeois society would have us believing that we need luxury items. This need though is false and requires us to be consumers of commodities. The desire for commodities is a component of capitalism's reproduction and not a true need. That is not to say that the fulfillment we do get from purchasing items and consuming commodities is false, but because the determination of what constitutes needs is being determined after production rather than before production, we must conclude that what we believe will fulfill our needs is first thrust upon us through the lens of media campaigns launched by companies that have already produced what they want us to purchase. In this way, these needs are false. The hyperspecificity of the needs capitalism claims we have is an indicator of their falsity. In a more universal capacity, human beings do need to be entertained as a means of exercising the wide range of emotional and intellectual capacities. What shapes entertainment at this point in time is heavily determined by the mode of production and its reproduction and we are forced into coerced systems of exchange in order to attain the ability to meet these needs. Human beings have a number of different drives as well. We have the need to belong, the need for affection, the need for comfort, the need to love and be loved. These needs have been posited by Marxist psychologists such as Lev Vygotsky and of course Eric, Eric Fromm years ago, but increasingly studies on the human mind prove these assertions to be true. Dr. Matei explains increasing, ex, oh, sorry, explains the findings of psychologist Alan Shore when researching what he calls proximate separation. Proximate separation is when a child's parent is physically present, but emotionally distant. What Shore found in this research was increased behaviors wherein the child self-soothed, for example, with thumb sucking or rocking. Children with emotionally distant parents would be more susceptible to addiction later in life, whether it was addictive behaviors such as gaming addictions, sex addictions, and social media addiction, or addiction to substances, among many other possibilities for self-comforting behaviors. Dr. Matei also makes reference to Bruce Alexander's Rat Park experiment, wherein rates of heroin consumption were casual and harmless among rats who shared a cage with other rats and had a lot of stimuli and rates of heroin consumption were extremely high and lethal among rats who were isolated and alone. These behaviors can easily be observed in children who experience physical and emotional isolation as their brains produce higher levels of stress hormones such as cortisol that affect their brain development. Proximate separation has a similar effect on the child's brain development. The levels of physiological stress experienced by the child during proximate separation approach the levels experienced by the child during physical separation. The development of the brain's neurotransmitter and self-regulating systems, and in particular, the stress control circuits, are then disrupted, and once entrenched, these physiological dysfunctions increase the risk for addictions. Addictive tendencies may already be seen in young children. The innumerable studies that emphasize and prove that human beings have psychological needs that need to be fulfilled for them to thrive are typically used as a means of framing a self-help and better parenting approach. While there are certainly situations where the parent must take responsibility for the trauma that they have caused their children, for example, abuse of all kinds and purposeful neglect, the vast majority of instances where children are not receiving the care and comfort required in childhood is caused by the parent's own emotional and physiological needs not being met with ease or at all due to an existing or due to an existence within a mode of production in which they are forced to participate that alienates them from their own creative capacities and each other. 
Human nature can therefore be defined by the psychological needs we have developed as we evolved as social conscious creatures. How we relate to ourselves and each other is determined by the mode of production. And thus, the mode of production is what determines whether our, our psychological needs are met, as well as how they are being met. As has been mentioned, capitalism has certainly promoted ineffective palliatives to satiate our needs in order to build profits and to reproduce capitalism while keeping work workers complacent. And as a result, we relate to one another by promoting false needs and trying to feed what we believe to be our needs. Every man sp speculates upon creating a new need in another to force him to a new sacrifice, to place in him a new dependence, and to entice him into a new kind of pleasure and thereby into economic ruin. Everyone tries to establish over others an alien power in order to find there the satisfaction of his own egoistic needs. The notion that we can achieve our needs through engaging in the market dynamics that place us in competition with one another, rather than by collectively cooperating as social beings to achieve meeting the needs of all, reduces human beings to the animal, and therefore this individuating root of bourgeois ideology is reactionary. Bourgeois economic theory seems, after we robbed it of its ugly secret with Marx, to be a continuation of the beastly point of departure rather than a step towards the divine point of arrival to which we clung for thousands of years. After we have left the beastly state, which is natural and therefore not low, behind us, the level which we will reach does not need any idols, no angels and no spirits. It is simply human. We believe that science of our species is capable of naming its characteristics before reaching this stage at the level of visible and tangible reality and without the intercession of a miracle. As a result, we are demonstrating with it that in existing society, which emerged from the liberal revolution, we are still on the side of beastly nature rather than that of human. Some would argue that reforms to capitalism can move us closer to reaching all human physiological and psychological needs. There are a number of reasons why a mode of production that is ruled by capital cannot meet the needs of human beings. One of the main reasons is that it is inherently contradictory to human nature, as it is predicated upon the alienation of labor. Capitalism encompasses a particular relation between specific classes that are produced through those relations. A handful of property owners hire workers to labor in exchange for a wage. The worker has no control over what they produce and little control over the parameters of how. Workers are exploitable due to the fact that they do not own property. Therefore, they are in a position to be exploited by those who do own private property. They are forced to produce, not for the good of their fellow human beings, but, but for the purpose of the accumulation of profit of whoever or whatever owns the means by which they produce. The worker takes on the character of a commodity to be purchased by those who hold capital, business owners. In this way, workers are objectified. Workers are but objects separated from their creative capacities as they are forced to partake in relations where they have no control over the means of their own subsistence. So they can make a wage to purchase other objects to sustain them for another workday. This process, called alienation, has three components. The worker is alienated from the products of their labor, the worker is alienated from other workers, and the worker is alienated from themselves. Human social relations are reduced to relations between objects. Mark, Marx aptly describes alienation in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. What constitutes the alienation of labor? First, that the work is external to the worker that it is not part of his nature, and that consequently he does not fulfill himself in his work, but denies himself, has a feeling of misery rather than well-being, does not develop freely in his mental and physical energies, but is physically exhausted and mentally debased. The worker therefore feels himself at home only during his leisure time, whereas at work he feels homeless. His work is not voluntary, but imposed, forced labor. It is not the satisfaction of need, but only a means of satisfying other needs. Its alien character is clearly shown by the fact that as soon as there is no physical or other compulsion, it is avoided like the plague. 
External labor, labor in which man alienates himself, is a labor of self-sacrifice, of mortification. Finally, the external character of work for the worker is shown by the fact that it is his own work, but the work that it is not his own work, but the work for someone else. That in work he does not belong to himself, but to another person. As noted, capitalism forces human beings into relations, cutting them off from control and freedom as regards the production of the means of their own survival. It reduces the worker to an object, and this infects every aspect of human social life. Relationships, whether they are familial, pl platonic, romantic, or sexual, mirror the relations between commodities. This is at the root of the increased rates and persistence of abusive relationships, bullying behaviors in social groups, and so on. As Fromm notes, what is modern man's relationship to his fellow man? It is one between two abstractions, two living machines who use each other. Everybody is to everybody else a commodity, always to be treated with certain friendliness, because even if he is not of use now, he may be later. Furthermore, Fromm explains the relationship humans have with themselves. He does not experience himself as an active agent, as the bearer of human powers. He is alienated from these powers. His aim is to sell himself successfully on the market. His sense of self does not stem from his activity as a loving and thinking individual, but from his socio-economic role. The alienated personality who is for sale must lose a good deal of the sense of dignity which is so characteristic of man even in most primitive cultures. He must lose almost all sense of self, of himself as a unique and induplic induplicable entity. The sense of self stems from the experience of myself as the subject of my experiences, my thought, my feeling, my decision, my judgment, my action. It presupposes that my experience is my own and not an alienated one. Things have no self, and man who have become things can have no self. Things have no self, and man who have become things can have no self. Capitalism represses the worker's sense of self. This is, in and of itself, poor mental health and an increase in the potential outcome of mental illness. How can one tolerate having the capability of knowledge of self while being simultaneously alienated from their self through a system where they are forced into submitting as an object to be controlled through the will of capital? The consequences of this contradiction are clear through the rising rates of mental illness, suicide, and of course, addiction. And these rates continue to grow as the effects of alienation compound and worsen with each successive generation. Alienated workers are raising children with a profound amount of stress. Aside from the very real factor of occupational and financial stress, alienation infects our ability to relate to ourselves and each other in a meaningful capacity. Workers are separated from their children, partners, friends, and other loved ones while they work long days at jobs where they feel disconnected from the labor they perform because they are disconnected from the labor they perform. They return home exhausted, miserable, and depressed and have great difficulty finding the energy to engage their children and loved ones in a rewarding manner. This lack of genuine comfort and affection increases stress in children, adolescents, and adults considerably. Dr. Gabor Mate notes, the importance of this point cannot be overstated. Emotional nurturance is an absolute requirement for healthy neurobi neurobiological brain development. He goes on to state that, Attachment is the drive to pursue and preserve closeness and contact with others. An attachment relationship exists when that state has been achieved. It's an instinctual drive programmed into the, the mammalian brain owing to the absolute helplessness and dependency of infant mammals, particularly infant humans. Without attachment, he cannot survive. Without safe, secure, and non-stressed attachment, his brain cannot develop optimally. Although that dependency wanes as we mature, attachment relationships remain important throughout our lifetime. This attachment is not only a challenge, but it has become almost entirely impossible under this advanced stage of capitalism due to prolonged alienation of human beings en masse. This has a number of consequences. In the formative years, this has an impact on brain development. 
While human beings are certainly born with particular genetic and biological potentialities, the environment is what leads to these potentialities being expressed and how they are expressed. If capitalism creates a contradiction between potentials of the mind and repression of the needs inherent in developing these potentials, we are left in a situation where, where we are quite miserable. What this means for human beings, however, is that there, are, there is a profound impact on brain development. There are time. Oh, hold on. There are times... In the first year of life, when every second multiple millions of nerve connections or synapses are established, three quarters of our brain growth takes place outside of the womb, most of it in the early years. If workers' emotional needs are not being met, if they are unable to build attachments and meaningful connections as previously described, if they are alienated from themselves and others, what impact might that have on a child? A parent who experiences stress, depression, isolation as a result of their circumstances will create such responses in the child. Studies have repeatedly shown that infants are emotionally impacted by the most subtle expressions of distress in their parents. Thus, the parent's brain programs the infants. A high release of stress hormones in an infant's brain has an impact on the development of chemical receptors. Because the brain is consistently flooded with these hormones, less receptors are developed, and these recept receptors are responsible not only for the process of stress, but for pleasurable processes in the brain as well. Studies on cocaine users have shown that these people have fewer dopamine receptors in their brains. Dr. Matei posits that the issue of fewer dopamine receptors existed before the cocaine usage and is responsible for the addiction to the drug. Cocaine creates a sudden rise in dopamine levels, levels that the user was unable to achieve through healthier means. The cocaine in turn results in the decline of the existing receptors, making it so the, use, the user becomes dependent and addicted to the dopamine releases caused by the cocaine use. It is a vicious cycle. While excessive substance use certainly worsens the state of one's mental health, Research has been showing for years that many of the damage we have believed substances caused to the brain existed before the actual substance use. Stressed and alienated parents are raising stressed children who are also alienated, and that cycle continues, compounding the effects with every generation. The crisis of mental health and addiction grows worse and worse. The fact of addiction is quite simple. Capitalism prohibits our brains from developing its emotional capacities in a healthy manner. It is what many professionals consider a chronic brain condition. Drugs resemble the brain's natural chemicals, which are not being produced effectively in the person's brain to begin with, and thus our defec defective brains become addicted to a substance that has a negative physiological impact that worsens the pre-existing brain conditions that made that addiction possible. As Dr. Matei states, in reality, the constellations of behaviors we call addiction is provoked by a complex set of neurobiological and emotional mechanisms that develop inside a person. Marxism, Marxism gives us the explanation for why these mechanisms are developing in such a way. Marx states, this mode of production must not be considered simply as being the production of the physical existence of the individuals. Rather, it is a definite form of these individuals, a definite form of expressing their lives, a definite mode of life on their part. As individuals express their life, so they are. What they are, therefore, coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. The nature of individuals thus depends on the material conditions determining their production. This explanation is supported not only by science through the aforementioned scientific studies and research on the human brain, but also by the extent to which addiction has grown as an undeniable social problem around the globe. Many would consider addiction a personal problem, not a social one. However, as Dr. Matei says, I hope it's clear, however, that in the real world, choice, will, and responsibility are not absolute and unambiguous concepts. People choose, decide, and act in a context, 
and to a large degree, that context is determined by how their brains function. The brain itself also develops in the real world, influenced by conditions over which the individual as a young child had no choice whatsoever. The brain is being developed in a real world ruled by capital, where workers are objectified, alienated, and put under huge amounts of stress that impact their mental health and decision making, in turn affecting the brain development of children and adolescents. We are social, social beings disconnected from each other and ourselves. The cause of our mental anguish se seems to be clear. Why do people choose to take a drug? Well, often people take drugs for the first time before the age of 25, when their decision-making abilities are normally not fully formed, and use is highest among this age group. People might choose to take drugs or consume alcohol for the relief they feel when they are under the substance's influence. Many even begin to take drugs for more practical purposes, such as wanting to stay awake at night to ensure their own safety while living on the street. And that is not to mention the developmental problems in the or orbitofrontal co cortex, the portion of the brain responsible for decision-making, inhibiting consideration for long-term consequences in favor of short-term relief, which is only worsened by prolonged substance use. Calling addiction a choice is absolutely reductive, idealistic, and not supportable by either scientific or Marxist investigation. Drug and alcohol addiction may be the most fatal of addictions, but addiction goes well beyond these substances alone. A lot of pe people experience addictions to caffeine, tobacco, nicotine, sugar, food. There are also an array of behavioral addictions, such as sex, video games, pornography, television, shopping, working, and so on. Social media, for example, is a growing behavioral addiction. People use social media in a desperate attempt to make others know who we are, and we do so within the parameters of capitalism and bourgeois ideology, selling ourselves as commodities for likes, shares, and comments, so we can get a hit of endorphins or oxytocin that our brains crave. Addiction is absolutely overwhelmingly a consequence of capitalism and alienated labor. The only solution to the crisis of addiction is to drastically change the way we live. Simply caring more for others will not suffice. Buying into the self-care fad only makes the problem worse, commodifying the human experience of suffering. Alexandra Kalantai, an influ influential Bolshevik during the October, October Revolution who was deeply concerned with the plight of women and children said, People have perhaps never in any age felt spiritual loneliness as deeply and persistently as at the present time. People have probably never become so desperate and fallen so fully under the numbing influence of this loneliness. It could hardly be otherwise. It could hardly be otherwise due to alienated labor, which is inherent to capital. In order to overcome the crisis of addiction, we must change the relations under which we live. We must produce collectively for the needs of all rather than producing under coercion for the purpose of capital. Only this will end the cycle of addiction. The, ab the abolition of capitalism is the answer to the crisis, but we are suffering today. It is imperative for us to support harm reduction me measures. The full legalization of drugs, access to safe drug supplies, sites for safe consumption, adequate mental health care, and so on, is necessary to keep workers alive today. It is also important for us to join in solidarity with all workers who are suffering, pulling them into the militant com communist cause. Communist militancy and solidarity is a harm reduction tactic. According to Nuevo Curso, the communist militant is not alone in his political action. To live consciousness to live consciously means that in all his activity, the tension of the future is present, so that to some extent it becomes present. The capacity to find the history of humanity and its progress in what surrounds us, to discover the secular struggle of our species, to reach abundance in everyday things, opens us up to the capacity to enjoy the most basic things, a different form of pleasure that is contagious and helps our own, our own to resist, making present the possibility and the necessity of communism. It is that struggle for the abundance of the species which today is concentrated and decided in the universal class that is the distinctive element of communist morality.